For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the brink of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. Remember we read Ephesians 6, verses 11 to 20 from Paul, where he uses an extended analogy from his day, of course, he was living in the Roman Empire. And, you know, most of you have studied a smattering of history enough to see diagrams of Roman soldiers with their full kit, little short stabbing sword, the, the uh, very utilitarian armor. Even their shoes were quite special, the sandals. And he's using that as an imagery with, a, with an analog to all of the important parts of the Christian's uh, battle armor, if you like, spiritual armor you know, the word of God, and so on. And he says, as a reminder, and it's our reminder today, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. You know, in the valley of humiliation, Pilgrim, John Bunyan, met a certain fiend. Good time to remind you of Liberty Magazine again. Here's our... uh, January, February issue. And most of you are far away. But on the cover is an old woodcut from an early edition of Pilgrim's Progress. And the title is The Front Line of Faith. Where you and I are now, by the way. The Front Line of Faith. And there is that uh, armored figure back on his, not just on his heels, lying in the corner with his shield up, it's true, but he looks like to be overwhelmed by a fearsome beast with a lion's head and, and uh, you know, very uh, uh, animalistic uh, arms and, and body and the darts like arrows or like uh, lightning bolts are coming at him thick and fast. That was an illustration of Christian meeting Apollyon, a representative for, for the powers of evil, meeting him in the Valley of Humiliation when he was most vulnerable. And I want to read you a little bit of the dialogue because it underscores what was going on at that time with with Bunyan and indeed with Christianity and at least in England and then in the greater Western world. He says, in the Valley of Humiliation, poor Christian was hard put to it. And he said, uh, then he met Apollyon. Uh, It says, the monster was hideous to behold. He was clothed with scales like a fish. They are his pride. He had wings like a dragon and feet like a bear, and out of his belly came fire and smoke, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. And when he was come up to Christian, he beheld him with the disdainful countenance and began to question with him, whence come you and whither are you bound? I am come from the city of destruction, said Christian, which is the place of all evil, and am going to the city of Zion. By this I perceive that thou art one of my subjects, says Apollyon, for all that country is mine, and I am the prince and god of it. How is it then that thou hast run away from thy king? Were it not that I hope that thou mayest do me more service, I would strike thee now with one blow to the ground. Christian said, I was indeed born in your kingdom, but your service was hard and your wages such as a man could not live on, for the wages of sin is death. Therefore, when I was come to years, I did as other thoughtful persons do, to look out perhaps if I might mend myself. There is no prince, says Apollyon, that will lightly lose his subjects, neither will I as yet lose thee. But since thou art complainest of thy service and wages, be content to go back, and what our country will afford thee, I do here promise to give thee. But I have let myself to another, says Christian, even to the king of princes. And how can I with fairness go back with thee? Thou hast done in this according to the proverb, says Apollyon, changed a bad for a worse. But it is common for those that have called themselves his servants after a while to give him the slip and return again to me. Do so thyself and all shall be well. I have given him my faith 
says Christian. I've given him my faith and sworn my service to him. How then can I go back from this and not be hanged as a traitor? Thou didst the same to me, says Apollyon, and yet I'm willing to pass all by if thou wilt. Yet turn again and go back. What I promised in my youth, says Christian, was in my youth. And besides, I count that the prince under whose banner I now serve has set me free and it will pardon what I did when my service with thee. And besides, O destroying Apollyon, to speak the truth, I like his service, his servants, his government, his company and country better than thine. Therefore, leave off to persuade me further. I am his servant and I will follow him. Consider what that game, what, the, what the, when thou art in cold blood, is said as Apollyon. What thou art likely to meet with in the way when thou goest. Thou knowest that for the most part his servants come to an ill end because they are disobedient against me and my ways. How many of them have been put to shameful death? And besides, thou countest his service better than mine, whereas he never yet came from the place where he is to deliver any that serve him out of their hands. But as for me, how many times, as all the world well knows, have I delivered either by power or fraud those that have faithfully served me from him and his, though taken by them. And so I will deliver thee, says Apollyon. And Christian gives an answer that you should understand. He says, his forbearing at present to deliver them is on purpose to try their love, whether they will cleave to him to the end. And as for the ill end, thou sayest, they come to, that is most glorious in their account. For, for present deliverance, they do not much expect it. For they stay for their glory. And then they shall have it when their prince comes in his and the glory of the angels. Then Napoleon broke out into a grievous rage, saying, I am an enemy to this prince. I hate his person, his laws, his people. I am come on purpose to withstand thee. And I don't want to spend the rest of the time reading all of it, but they battle furiously. And then Apollyon seemed to be defeating Christian, and it says, uh, and with that he had almost pressed him to death, so that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching his last blow, whereby to make a full end of the good man, Christian nimbly reached out his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And with that gave him a deadly thrust, which made him give back as one that had received his mortal wound. Christian, perceiving that, made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that, Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings and sped him away, that Christian for a season saw him no more. You know, that's the real battle. I don't know about you. Maybe... You know, you're sealed before time and have no troubles. But I can tell you, night or day, but often particularly at night, I've had those troubles. I've had to deal with Apollyon. We all have. And without proper weapons, we're going to go down. That's what John Bunyan understood very well. He was an ex-soldier. He'd fought in that civil war. He fought when he was just a soldier, not a Puritan or a, or, or a Christian particularly at all. But he understood the life and death nature of the struggle. It's not, you know, purely symbolic. It's real. It's a battle for survival. I don't know how many of you, as I said, have read Pilgrim's Progress. How many of you have read Grace Abounding? Any hands? I don't think it's read today. But it's just as significant a book as John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote many books, but Grace Abounding, with a very short title. You know, they had short titles back then. <laughs> but the shortest type version of it is Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. But its full title is like three, four lines. But it's the story of John Bunyan's own life and his spiritual journey. And again, with your indulgence, I want to read just a short excerpt from it which puts things exactly where they should be for you and I today, I believe, in this spiritual battle, this warfare to maintain our integrity against all comers. John Bunyan said this. 
He says, I fell into company with one poor man that made profession of religion, who, as I then thought, did talk pleasantly of the scriptures and of the matters of religion. Wherefore, falling into some love and liking to what he said, I betook me to my Bible and began to take great pleasure in reading, but especially with the historical parts thereof. Thus I continued for about a year, he says, all of which time our neighbours did take me to be a very godly man, a new and religious man, and did marvel much to see such a great and famous alteration in my life and manners. And indeed so it was, though yet I knew not Christ, nor grace, nor faith, nor hope. For as I have well seen since, had I then died, my state would have been most fearful. Yet I love to be talked of as one that was truly godly. I was proud of my godliness, and indeed I did all I did, either to be seen of or to be well spoken of by men. But upon a day, the good providence of God called me to Bedford to work, work on my calling. And in one of the streets of that town, I came where there were three or four poor women sitting at a door in the sun, talking about the things of God. And being now willing to hear them discourse, I drew near to hear what they said, for I was now a brisk talker also myself in the matters of religion. But I may say, I heard, but I understood not, for they were far above, out of my reach. Their talk was about a new birth, the work of God on their hearts, also how they were convinced of their miserable state by nature. They talked how God had visited their souls with his love in the Lord and, and what with words and promises they had been refreshed, comforted and supported against the temptations of the devil. And methought, they spake as if joy did make them speak. They spake with such pleasantness and of scripture language and with such appearance of grace in all that they said that they were to me as if they had found a new world, as if they were people that dwelt alone and they were not to be reckoned among their neighbours. At this, I felt my own heart began to shake and mistrust my condition to be naught, for I saw that in all my thoughts about religion and salvation, the new birth did never enter into my mind, neither knew I the comfort of the word and promise, nor the deceitfulness and treachery of my own wicked heart. By these things, my mind was now so turned, and I better explain this sentence as, and I'll begin it again before I read it. In Australia, when I used to go walking in the woods, especially after rain, uh, and I was usually barefoot and short, with shorts on, you could guarantee you'd get a bunch of leeches very long ones around Sydney where I grew up. Long leeches clinging to you and you pull them off. They didn't resist much, but then the blood would flow freely. But the, the leeches would suck and suck and you'd have 10, 20 of them on your legs. Quite an experience. So now here's an interesting figure. John Bunyan says, by these things my mind was now so turned that it lay like a horse leech at the vein still crying out, give, give. Yea, it was so fixed on eternity and on the things about the kingdom of heaven that as far as I know, uh, there was yet God knows I knew but little, neither pleasures nor profits nor persuasions nor threats could lose it, loose it or make it let go its hold. I believe that experience is as powerful as anything he wrote in Pilgrim's Progress. And I've been convinced for a long time, that's the key to everything. Talking about religion is the grandest waste of time by and large. And, if, and as you read uh, further in Pilgrim's Progress, you know, he, he pulls up some, some uh, interestingly named figures, hypocrisy and so on, that love to talk about religion, but they're going nowhere. In fact, we're not going to heaven because we talk fluidly about religion. We're not even going to heaven because we're Seventh-day Adventists. If you read Ellen White carefully, that can be the greatest uh, delusion to think that you're saved by being one of the group. In fact, as the, the affair and the conflict sharpens, Ellen White says that it's the nominal Adventists 
that are the worst enemies to turn against and betray those who are being faithful. So we're not saved by being Adventists, as, as admirable as our calling is, as unique as the remnant that we're called to belong to might be, as necessary to a prophetic fulfillment. But I believe as truly as back in the days of Jesus when he walked by night with Nicodemus and tried to get him to see what's really going on, the need as now, now as then is for a heart change. I believe as a Seventh-day Adventist that uh, what A.T. Jones, Alonzo T. Jones, the first editor of our Religious Liberty Journal, uh, understood was the real issue. Remember, he was faced with an incipient national Sunday law. And please go online and read it sometime if you're ever thinking that they jumped the gun unnecessarily. There are blue laws aplenty, 20 or so still on the books, or 20 or, four, or more states still have them on the books in this country. And, and recently deceased Antonin Scalia said, they're not unconstitutional. You know, Sunday laws are fine. Well, we'll find out soon. But the one that was, was put forward by uh, Senator Blair in 1888, uh, if you read it online, it's, it doesn't mince any words. Under pain of law, you to cease all activity, all commercial activity on Sunday to attend church. That's a Sunday law. And A.T. Jones was convinced this was the final conflict, if you like, the final test for God's people. And what was his response? I think he'd, he, 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 he thought it through adequately. And remember, in his era, in Ellen White's time, John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, John Milton's uh, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, uh, the, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and of course the Bible, standard reading. They understood this. And A.T. Jones was so convinced that it was about to happen and that his, his, his fellow church members, only about 25,000 of them, were not ready that, that he appeared there at that, that general conference session in 1888 to call for revival. And not just revival of energy. You know, the, the, in Ezekiel, it says, how are the dead bones going to rise again? If they never had life before, they're not going to easily rise. You, you know, if someone was never converted, they need to be converted first time, not find the old conversion. You know, not the old, uh, at the very least, you know, we've got to be careful. There's a story I read years and years ago about a fellow that had a wonderful conversion experience. His, his uh, Christian experience, he called it. And he used to go to many, many meetings and tell it over and over again. Uh, and then one... One horrible day, he was asked to tell it, and he lost a piece of paper. And he says, I've lost my Christian experience. Yeah, it's figurative, but it can be very true. What happened, you know, I can remember as a young person being stirred by these things, not just uh, there in the empty lot. But at some point, we've all uh, been faced with, with a spiritual call. But it's easily possible to, to lose your first love. It's very possible. In fact, it's certain for our church in, in the Western world. I know it. We need to stir ourselves with a first love. We need to be born again. Because even a Seventh-day Adventist, and I, I remember a dream also when I was about 12. I had a dream that it was the second coming. And in my dream, it was... You know, a bit like this front cover. I guess I've been reading too many historical books. It was a painted scene, like a backdrop. And, and uh, I could see the mechanism on the side and, uh, sides and hear it being wound back. They were cranking back the sky and it opened up. And here were the angels, sort of painted figures and the trumpets up and down. And I remembered thinking to myself, I must be happy. I must be happy. If you look happy. Because if you're happy, it'll all be fine. You can nut it through. But remember ignorance and vain hope at the end of Pilgrim's Progress. You know, the gates don't open to a bold, faithless uh, profession. But if we're about this business, if we're on the king's highway, going to the celestial city, surely we'll want to get there. Surely we will see the fulminations of all of these powers as, as a sign that something is happening, that they're being agitated. Surely if there's any opposition to the word of God, if there's any opposition to God's purposes, it justifies that we're on a good cause. 
what sort of a, of a journey would it be if nobody cared if you're on the King's Highway, if the world went about its way, uh, unthinking and uncaring and unchallenged? Silly when you think about it. I'm positive last time I was here, I quoted from Spurgeon because I'm very partial to Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the preacher of, of, of uh, 150 years or so ago, roughly the same time that the Adventist church began. He was preaching in, in England. He's called the Prince of Preachers. And you go online, you can find many of his sermons. And I want to quote from one. This is sermon, oh, it's a very early one, seven, sermon number 78, but they're up in the many hundreds. And this was called The Character of God's People. And he wrote this. He says, a Christian is as essentially different from a worldling as a dove is from a raven or a lamb from a lion. He is not of the world, even in his nature. You could not make him into a worldling. You might do what you liked. You might cause him to fall into some temporary sin, but you could not make him a worldling. You might cause him to backslide, but you could not make him a sinner as he used to be. He is not of the world by his nature. He's talking about a regenerate Christian. He is a twice-born man. In his veins rub the blood of the royal family of the universe. He is a nobleman. He is a heaven-born child. His freedom is not merely a bought one, but he hath his, but he hath his liberty, his newborn nature. He is essentially and entirely different from the world. Is that true? It better be true. And Adventists, more than anyone, better find that it's true in our lives. We're not, as I said, we're not saved by being Adventists. Adventism is a reform movement within Christianity. It's a loud cry within Christianity. And within Christianity, there is no way to be a true Christian but to have a new birth. And, and somehow we need to rediscover it corporately, but corporately starts individually. And I'm sure in this time, this little time of peace, but in reality, Ellen White in her own day said that the plagues of God are, are already falling. She said the time of trouble has already begun. So I don't know what we're waiting for. I see it the other way around. I think the angels are pushing and holding against the time of trouble. And, 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 and use another figure. We're going around and around in a holding pattern. And once we, or, or, or some that answer to our calling, once we decide to speak up and speak out and to act up, then it will all be on. Then Napoleon will come whisking across the fields and we better reach for that weaponry, but with it, the victory is assured. I uh, was looking through some of my father's effects the other day, and I've got a basement just overflowing uh, with material that I don't know what to do with it. I'm loath to throw some stuff out, but when uh, my mother died, I inherited everything from their home, and it's in my basement, my garage, and the, so I'm sort of slowly going through, and I found a little book called A Little Time of Peace that used to belong to my father, and, and it has the date written into it when he got it. He was 17 years old, and it's marked up quite a bit. Uh, it was a compilation of Ellen White quotes, but they printed it in, you know, in uh, 1919, just on the good side of World War I. Uh, you don't get the same feeling in the US, but in Australia, even now, you go into little country towns, they invariably will have a monument to the Great War with the names of all those who died. It was the great killing fields. And uh, even far away Australia sent all too many people to uh, dash themselves on the, the broken dreams of empires. And you know, if you know any history, it was World War I that broke the system and it's never been put back together and in fact getting much, much worse since that great war. Adventists at that era must have recognized it. And my father had bracketed uh, several statements in this one. I want to read it to you. She says, everything in the world is in agitation. The signs of the times are ominous. Coming events cast their shadows before. The Spirit of God is withdrawing from the earth, and calamity follows calamity by sea and by land. There are tempests, earthquakes, fires, floods, 
murders of every grade. Who can read the future? Where is security? Where is assurance? There is assurance in nothing that is human or earthly. Rapidly are men ranging themselves under the banner they have chosen. Restlessly are they waiting and watching the movements of their leaders. Never more restless than today, right? There are those who are waiting and watching and working for our Lord's appearing. Hope it's us. Another class are falling into line under the generalship of the great apostate. Few believe with heart and soul that we have a hell to shun and a heaven to win. We need to see it in these cosmic grand terms that at different times in history it's occurred to God's followers, sharpened by the reality around them. John Bunyan didn't create the Civil War. Uh, Doubtless he would have been a differently honed Christian in a different time. But the facts are he lived in that time. He fought in that war. He, he interacted with even, even the, the post-Civil War era there still would not allow independent religious thought of, of his kind. And so he took the punishment. I can promise you today, even with the Constitution sitting safely under glass in Washington, And uh, admittedly, a lot of precedents have been set that negate a good percentage of it. But even today, with the law that you think protects you, if you acted as John Bunyan and the great faithful through the ages and went out and cried, cried aloud and spared not, you would be persecuted. I know that because Jesus gave us many promises. And one of them, he said, all who live a, a godly life will suffer persecution. We need to see the real reality. You know, this is not a time of peace, as the Bible says, a little folding of the hands, a little rest, a little slumber. Who can sleep in such a time? The Lord is soon to come. And my father's resting now, and when, when, when he died, I, I thought, you know, if it's a trillion years for him, be like that. But the facts are, you and I are still alive. We still play in time's pond. And in this little time of grace granted to us, We need to do what we can to hasten the day of his appearing, not delay it. The angels might be holding back the winds of strife, but why? That's the big question for religious liberty, and I'll end on this point. Think for a minute. Why would God hold back the time of of trouble? I find no record in the Bible that just to save anyone's skin, God will answer that prayer. Never. Never. It's actually a sign of self rather than than a God-directed life. He will delay if we can be instruments of his grace to other people. If the loud cry can be given yet, God will hold it back. And in the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the seesaw dynamic of predestination and foreknowledge, of course, when we speak out, it will precipitate trouble. But at the same time, God will provide opportunity And my prayer today, my challenge to you, is that you and I can be, as as C.S. Lewis, and I don't generally like C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, said, it's not a question of whether we're good men. Are we new men and women? We've got to be changed. If so, people will look at Adventists, look at us, and see that we've been with Jesus in a very special way. Thank you, and God bless you. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.